Okay, so good morning. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we're going to have a, a change of gears uh, this week, a little bit, not completely. Um, so we have four uh, speakers, and today, I'm sorry, this week, who will be uh, talking about uh, various uh, theoretical developments and ideas uh, relate relating to glassy behavior and glassy dynamics, slow dynamics. And uh, so that's Jorge Kurchan, who will uh, speak today, Francesco Zamponi, um, uh, Patrick Chabonneau, and Ludovic Berthier. And um, so, and, and we also have uh, another set of lectures by Francesco Shortino on self-assembly, that's sort of a a trailer, trailing end of, of the self-assembly uh, theme from last week. And uh, so my job, uh, uh, as discussed, is uh, really to give you a bit of a background and an overview on uh, the phenomenology of glass formers and, uh, and glasses. And uh, so I'll, I'll be sort of going over a large number of different topics. Uh, I, I did my best to try and organize them in some logical order and, and discover that, uh, like in other things glassy, there is frustration uh, that's intrinsic to the, uh, to the problem. Uh, so there isn't quite the best way of doing it. I've, I've sort of uh, I've tried to uh, have some logical flow in what I say. And um, not all of what I say will necessarily be uh, sort of uh, needed background for, for the coming uh, lectures, but this is sort of uh, meant to give you a perspective uh, with which you can approach uh, the other lectures. Okay. Um, so I'm going to begin very elementary, and uh, since I know that there are a number of of people in the audience uh, who do know something about the topic uh, among the students. I don't mean the, the, the lecturers and the faculty here, um, but the, the participants in the, uh, in the school. Uh, I will sort of pause to ask you to say things that I would otherwise have to say, OK? Uh, so I'll be asking you questions about what, what uh, But here is um, a very elementary definition of what we are talking about. So what are glasses? And uh, so quite generally, uh, we, when we talk about glasses, we talk about systems that are disordered um, and which are in a frozen in or jammed or arrested structure or state. Uh, these are different ways of talking about what a glassy state is. And uh, again, generally, they're not in equilibrium. Okay, so these are three uh, basic uh, uh, ideas to keep in mind. And uh, so the well-known case of a glass for most of us in everyday language is silica in its amorphous solid form. Um, and uh, this glass exists under thermodynamic conditions, that is, normal temperatures and pressures, uh, under which the stable uh, state is crystalline, namely uh, quartz, okay? Um, and uh, so here is a cartoon representation in two dimensions of what the difference between the crystalline state is and, and, and the, the amorphous state is. Uh, what is sought to be represented here is uh, Let's see, I think the blue dots are supposed to be silicon atoms and the red dots are oxygen atoms. Um, and uh, so you have each silicon that is uh, connected to three oxygen atoms. And, and uh, this is sort of, and each oxygen atom is connected to two silicon atoms. And this on the left hand side uh, happens in a very periodic fashion. So you have crystalline uh, silica and uh, on the other hand, in the right-hand side, you have uh, 
the same local geometry, that is, each blue dot is connected to three red dots, um, and each red dot is, is connected to two blue dots, but you see that there are a wide range of uh, distances and angles, and, and more sort of in, importantly, in uh, the sizes of the rings that you have to go around in order to come back to the same place. Okay, here in the crystalline arrangement, all the rings are one, two, three, four, five, six members, uh, whereas in the case of the amorphous solid, uh, there is a greater diversity. Uh, so this is now um, the distinction between uh, the crystalline and the amorphous uh, structure, yes. No, I didn't say anything about thinning, and, and that will generally not be a feature of the systems we're going to be looking at. Um, <clears throat> what I mean is simply that, uh, as we will see, uh, in one way or the other, the final state that I end up with in an experiment that I call a glass is not, uh, in any sense, a true equilibrium state. So it's not an equilibrium. What? That's always the case. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so then uh, a little bit about. Okay. So you have these uh, funny solids. Well, so why should we care? And uh, um, so I'll say a couple of words about why some aspects of understanding these amorphous solids uh, glasses is interesting, and at the top I, I, I have put this quote uh, by Anderson, uh, which is uh, uh, basically says that you know, the nature of the glass is, is uh, in, in his view, uh, this was actually said uh, more than uh, two decades ago, uh, um, <coughs> is, is one of the most interesting unsolved problems in solid state theory, right? And uh, so uh, why is that? Uh, a quick run through uh, of, of why is that <clears throat> when we talk about problems in equilibrium statistical mechanics, uh, it, we, we have a basis to understand phase behavior and properties of substances. And this sort of simple statement is complicated a little bit when one encounters situations where one has uh, metastable states uh, or states that get stuck far away from what ought to be the equilibrium state. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, so that the system uh, for, for long times is not in the global free energy minimum. Okay? And uh, among, between these two categories, uh, metastable states are simpler in the sense that I can think of some set of conditions thermodynamically where the state that I'm looking at, the phase that I'm looking at, is the stable phase. So there's some part of the phase diagram where, <coughs> as we'll talk, you know, where we're going to talk about supercool liquids. So supercool liquids, you know, what it is, is easy enough to comprehend because I know that if I am above the freezing temperature, the liquid is the global free energy minimum. Right? Then if I change conditions so that I'm now below the free energy minimum, I'm sorry, below the freezing temperature, then uh, I have a state which is not the global free energy minimum, but I understand that it's, uh, it's an extension of an equilibrium state elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, uh, what I'm calling arrested states, uh, which glasses belong to, uh, uh, does not sort of lend itself to a very simple description. There is no simple order parameter description for these states, although we'll, we'll talk about what order parameter description one can think in terms of uh, towards the very end, I think. Um, 
not related to any stable state. So in other words, if I, if I were to think of a glass as a metastable state, I cannot say this is a state that is stable at such and such condition. Because the only stable state that it's connected to is the equilibrium liquid state. Okay? As, but these are not liquids. Right? So there's a difference between a supercool liquid being an extension of the equilibrium liquid versus a glass being an extension of the liquid state. <coughs> and one key um, feature of these kind of systems is that there is that the set of possible metastable states that you can be in uh, is very large. Okay? And uh, one can therefore associate an extensive entropy with it. And uh, this also goes by the name of complexity. Uh, <clears throat> and the presence of such complexity uh, seems also to be related to rather non-trivial dynamics uh, that one sees in, in, in classy systems with arbitrarily large relaxation times that in fact lead to the experimentally observed structural arrest transition. Okay? <coughs> so that's a thumbnail statement of why <coughs> why these uh, systems are interesting. And so here is sort of a, a checklist <coughs> of different aspects of uh, the glass problem. Uh, one which I'll sort of start out with because it's, it's often uh, not something that is, that is paid uh, much attention to uh, is the ability to form a glass in a, uh, in a in starting from the liquid state, okay? And uh, then uh, we have the phenomenon that <coughs> the, the, the relaxation uh, of any perturbations uh, in, in, in the liquid state become very large uh, as one goes to low temperatures. And uh, what that means, uh, we will talk in detail. And then there's the question of, when you go from the supercool liquid to the glass, uh, this is called glass transition. And what is the nature of this transition? Whether it's purely a, a kinetic phenomenon, uh, which invariably is experimentally, but in principle, whether there is something more to it is some question <coughs> that people have talked about and thought about. And then there is this um, interesting Phenomen, phenomenology of relaxation over uh, very large times, uh, very close to the glass transition, very close to our, our below the glass transition, the name of aging. <coughs> um, and uh, then one can think about once I've formed the glass, so I've gone below this so-called glass transition, and I'll tell you what that is. <clears throat> I end up with an amorphous solid, and I can ask, is this uh, going to be behaving like other solids that I know or not? Okay. So, um, and finally, um, there is this question about um, how the glass transition relates to other structural uh, RS processes. And uh, a particular example that's relevant <coughs> uh, today and in the coming days <coughs> is jamming, okay, which you already heard about from Bulpur last week. Okay, so <coughs> just to close this off, glass forming liquids are one example of systems that exhibit what is called glassy behavior. Uh, there are many other uh, such systems. And um, so um, spin glasses is a very prominent example, which we refer to as we go along. <coughs> and uh, jammed granular matter, as I already mentioned, is another example uh, which we pay attention to. Of course, in all of this, you know, I was talking about liquids and, and uh, 
implicitly I was sort of assuming that, uh, that what, what I'm describing are what are called molecular liquids, okay, things that are made up of atoms and molecules. Uh, but there are other kinds of fluid states of matter, such as uh, colloidal suspensions, <coughs> which uh, broadly, again, uh, go by the name of soft matter. And the soft refers to uh, a very low <coughs> elastic modulus in the solid state statements can be made otherwise, uh, which are in megapascals as opposed to gigapascals for uh, ordinary classes, silicon. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this is a, not a, an exhaustive list. Another example which is interesting is when you have vortices in superconductors which get pinned uh, because of uh, the presence of uh, impurities and pinning potentials. And they also exhibit glassy behavior. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> so this is what I'm going to now uh, continue and talk about. Uh, so I'm going to go over some basic phenomenology, characterization of dynamics. I'll describe what dynamical slowdown means, and then uh, this. Uh, is an important component of what we will be talking about in the next few days, configurational entropy and characterization of dynamics. Um, and then I'll talk about something called dynamical heterogeneity. And I will mention and, and describe a little bit, but not give a very complete discussion of growing length scales. And, uh, and then I'll very, very briefly mention uh, the relation. Jamming, and, and like I said, my job <coughs> is to sort of point to how the coming up lectures are connected to the overall scope of, of, of the phenomenology of glasses and glass, glass form of glasses. So I'll sort of tell you what those connections are. Okay, so let me pause here um, uh, because I, I, this is sort of the, the introduction to the introduction. So, <laughs> you, you, are there any questions at this stage? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> okay, hold, hold that thought. I will say something about it. Um, there is no obvious, I mean, there's no. Um, Okay, maybe I'll, I'll answer this now, yeah? So, and I'll answer this with a, a little story. Um, so I, I used to at some point think that uh, uh, the local geometry in the liquid state being similar to the crystalline uh, local geometry was kind of obvious, right? That's how it should be because it's the same atoms and molecules. And, and, uh, <coughs> And so <clears throat> when one of my colleagues sort of presented some results discovering this truth about some particular system he was looking, I, I was sort of not very impressed and, and he was not very happy about it. But later on uh, in a discussion with uh, one of the sort of big names in, in making metallic glasses, uh, during his talk he made uh, somebody called Inoue, who is now retired in Japan, in Sendai. Uh, he, he made reference to this distinction between glasses and, and amorphous solids. And uh, <clears throat> so apparently, and I asked him, what, what is the difference? And uh, his answer was, amorphous solids are those where the liquid structure is very close to the crystal. And therefore, you have to do something not straightforward to make them. Uh, ordinary glasses are those that are obtained by an easy enough procedure of cooling the liquid. Okay? And, and that ability to do so arises from there being no direct um, <coughs> correspondence between the local geometry and the crystal structure. And, 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 uh, sorry, 
in, in the liquid and, and in the crystals. Okay. But uh, I don't think there's a very precise answer to that, my knowledge, but that's sort of the practical distinction. So, as you'll notice, I'm not going to be making that distinction too strenuously because for, the, for my purposes, <coughs> it doesn't make it doesn't make sense. Okay, um, other silly questions like that. That's what he said. <laughs> so, <coughs> okay, so I'll, I'll give you one sort of clear-cut answer that I can give. Um, so, when you talk about glasses. Uh, there is sort of always implicitly this question of which degrees of freedom you're talking about when you talk about the glassiness, right? And uh, so one um, uh, sort of telling example is, is what are called plastic crystals, <coughs> where the crystals, you know, so the atoms are in regular arrangements or molecules, uh, and, and, uh, but they have orientational degrees of freedom which uh, in the normal state are free, okay? But then, at, uh, again, under conditions where they become glassy, these orientational degrees of freedom can get stuck. Okay, so the glassiness is in the orientational degrees of freedom, right? And likewise, if you think about uh, spin glasses, uh, again, you know, these can be materials which, which are ordered structurally, but, but the, the disorder uh, or the glassiness is in the spin degrees of freedom, et cetera. So that, that's sort of one clear cut answer. Uh, so there's no, you know, so it, <coughs> um, now what was the other question? Look like? Well, um, okay. No, I, 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 I wouldn't dare make a general statement of that kind. And there are obvious counterexamples. Liquids are disordered, gases are disordered. You know, the disordered states that are high temperature phases. So I guess a more uh, pointed question that could be asked is if I have low temperature phases that are disordered, are they always glass? Right? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, no, so there, there are Circumstances and systems, glassy systems for which that is true, that, 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 that the aging process is, is, uh, is indefinite. But uh, <clears throat> um, okay, so in practice, uh, if, like if I if I have a structural glass, like silica, at low enough temperatures, uh, certainly. Measurably, I, I can't see aging, right? So, um, but uh, you could say, you know, maybe this is happening on a time scale that you don't have access to, and that could be true. Um, <coughs> the other sort of possibility is that if there is a, a thermodynamic glass state, and, and if you were to be in, in that state, then you wouldn't have aging, right? Um, so, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's sort of what Bulbul was, was uh, referring to. Um, so, there, there's sort of two uh, related aspects which together seem to define what we typically refer to as glassy. One is that there's sort of many possible quasi-equilibrium substates, right? 
That is, the, the, these are uh, parts of phase space in which the system can lo get localized for very long times. And that does seem to be closely related to the fact that relaxation processes are very slow. Okay? So those two aspects are necessary in order to call a system classy. Uh, so if, if you have, uh, <coughs> I guess, I mean, um, so if you take, for example, something like uh, the random field easing model, right, in the high, uh, in the high disorder limit, I probably wouldn't call it like that. So, yeah, so, yeah, not, so all disordered states don't have to be glass. Um, so he's asking, are arrested states and metastables the same? Um, you know, for the time being, let's, let's say that what I referred to as metastable states here uh, were simple metastable states like a supercooling, right? Where I, I, I can, like I said, understand this metastable state as an extension of an equilibrium state, okay? Um, but that the term and the concept of metastable states will also arise in a more complicated way when we talk about glasses. Okay, so let's sort of not. Yeah. Uh, so let me let me come to that. Okay. Uh, so the the simple metastable states that I talked about so far, and the arrested states are different. Uh, but even in talking about the arrested states, the notion of metastability will come. Up. <coughs> but a very different kind. Okay. Okay, good question. Uh, that's not, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, but for, again, for, uh, uh, um, Articulate systems, you can ask that question. And uh, there's sort of two kinds of situations where you could ask that question. Uh, one is where the system you're talking about has um, uh, attractive interactions and uh, ones where you don't. Okay? So the... Uh, so for systems with... Uh, attractive interaction, sorry, without attractive interactions, where, which are simple. Um, so, you, you know, the, this the kind of system that has been looked at are systems of soft part, soft spheres. And there you can sort of imagine that if I go to higher and higher densities, uh, I have a higher and higher class transition temperature, right? And conversely, if I come down in density, <coughs> Glass transition temperature comes down. Okay. Now, what seems to be the case is that this will come down all the way to zero temperature um, at a point below which the sphere assemblies do not jam. Okay. If, if I were to look at them in the zero temperature limit, it's a little. I mean, I mean what I'm saying is not exactly right, but it's close to the close to the correct statement, um, that there is a low density limit uh, for glass formation in such systems. Now, if you look at um, <coughs> attractive systems, the situation is a little bit more complicated, okay? Uh, because uh, for attractive systems, I have the presence of the liquid gas uh, transition, uh, which defines a region in which the system cannot be homogeneous. Okay. But then, uh, again, in the spirit of 
everything else that we're going to be talking about, let's say I don't worry about the fact that I be a metastable liquid or metastable fluid, and I ask, you know, forget about liquid gas transition, uh, but as long as my system is a metastable, can I have a glass transition? Right? So then um, <coughs> you will have a glass transition line that, that can go on like this, where we understand that uh, below this density this is actually happening in the metastable liquid. Okay? However, uh, there is a second limit uh, that, that one also talks about when one talks about the, uh, the liquid gas uh, transition, which is an instability limit, a mechanical stability limit. <coughs> and uh, this is not... Uh, So this is not a, a very precisely defined limit, but there is uh, certainly a point beyond which experimentally or in principle, you can continue to have a, a, a well-defined liquid state free energy minimum. So then you can ask what happens when I approach that line? Okay. And uh, basically uh, the quick answer is that in fact, <coughs> There is some density which is defined by the possibility of this intersection uh, below which you cannot have uh, a material that's a homogeneous glass. Okay. Uh, however, <clears throat> you can have glassy systems as in systems that are, that are going to exhibit complex dynamics and will get are, are, are sort of arrested and get arrested, form even at lower densities, if you lift the caveat that they have to be homogeneous. Okay? And, and uh, just as a quick uh, uh, I mean just to quickly explain what, why that is, uh, basically the idea is if you, if you were to quench a high temperature fluid into this regime, <clears throat> Does anyone know what happens? What happens if I were to quench a high temperature supercritical fluid into a point <clears throat> that is between the mechanical stability limits? Nobody knows. Really? You're smiling. So you know the answer, but you're not there. You don't know. Nobody knows. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, but what happens if I'm inside the unstable region? You also don't know the answer. What? <laughs> huh? you know, there's a special reason for asking him, which I won't say. Correct. What happens if I decrease the temperature suddenly? At that, sitting at that density, if I decrease the temperature to below Tc, what happens? Hmm? Yeah, say it. No, I, I don't know. So and all of them don't know. So what happens? Take the mic and tell. So the system will grow to to the to up to a length scale with time. I don't understand what that means. Say it in a way that. Physically, I can understand. So what happens? So I have a homogeneous system here, <coughs> right, which is an equilibrium system. And then I've quenched the temperature to here, where at that density, I cannot have an equilibrium system. Then what happens? This system will come in phase-separated state. Correct. 
system will phase separate yeah. <coughs> and the phase separation between um, this point and this point okay let's not worry about this so the phase the phase separation between this point and this point will initially happen on small length scales and then it will grow right so this is uh, okay so you, if you if i look at some time <coughs> after i've done the quenching i might have like a very bicontinuous situation like this where i have you know so this is all one phase and this is the other phase and 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 this sort of characteristic lens scale will grow okay um so now, instead of quenching here, if we were to quench down to here, right, then I will have the same process of phase separation where I begin to form a dense region and a less dense region, right? But now, as I go towards what I think is the equilibrium liquid density, I'm, 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 I actually enter then the glass phase, where in principle the dynamics is arrested. Right? So there, there must be uh, <clears throat> a situation where as this phase separation keeps going, I form large enough chunks of the dense phase that they are in a glass state and therefore will not further uh, exhibit dynamics. So this is uh, a, yeah. OK, so let's not worry about nucleation. Huh? I'm already digressing too much. But uh, case where we have instability of the homogeneous fluid phase is what I'm talking about. No idea. You mean in the, in the metastable liquid? You mean here? Well, here is typically wh where you form the glass because you are you're usually no sorry no 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 sorry that's crystal metastability. Um, I don't know. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I don't know, and I I think there is not much known about this. Uh, because, in fact, well, in colloids, actually, you can you can look at it as a legitimate scenario, but for molecular liquids, these are all happening at negative pressure. Okay, so not too much data, and I don't think, <coughs> yeah, but there is a lot of work on on what I am describing, where you you form these bicontinuous structures which get arrested, right? So physical gelation supposed to happen in, in this manner. Okay. So let me, okay, maybe I, I will not say more because I do have a finite amount of time. Um, okay, other questions? You had one? <clears throat> oh, yeah. No, so the, the point is, um, <clears throat> in the Ising case, there is no mechanism to induce glassiness. Okay, but uh, anyway, let's move on huh? because, uh, <clears throat> but that I can tell you more about that later on. Huh? Um, so uh, the the, the <clears throat> I mean, in, in in the Ising case, you you will have full phase separation. Um, <clears throat> okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now let me um, come to the next topic, uh, which is uh, glass formation and glass forming ability. Okay. And uh, I said a little bit, I mean, I, 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 I had a fair number of things to say, but I, I'll try to make it brief. If you have any questions, you stop me. 
Uh, so if you read papers in the class literature, there is sort of this one uh, simple sentence which dismisses a whole class of uh, physics, right? Uh, where, where you start out saying, when crystallization is avoided, then you go on, right? Uh, but, but that's not a very trivial thing, right? When can you avoid crystallization? <clears throat> when you cool a liquid, because uh, this is now <clears throat> a sketch of the Gibbs free energy as a function of temperature. <clears throat> and uh, when the, this is, the red curve is a liquid branch, okay? And the blue curve is the crystal branch. You've all seen these, this picture before. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so if, if I go below this temperature that is marked PM uh, along the red curve, uh, can somebody say what will happen? The hint I'll say spontaneous. Okay. So what should happen if I'm sitting here? crystallizes because <coughs> the Gibbs free energy is, is spontaneously to be to the lowest possible value, right? So this branch here below Tm, which is the melting temperature, is the liquid, uh, is the metastable liquid branch, uh, which is uh, <coughs> called uh, also supercooled. And to confuse some people call it undercooled. Okay, so you decide which you like better, like super or under. Okay, um, so the so typically, though not always, uh, glass formation happens in the supercool liquid, right? And therefore, uh, and 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 here is actually sort of uh, something nice, uh, which is not so obvious. So if you keep going uh, down in temperature, at some point, if the glass transition happens. Uh, what is shown here is uh, a change in the manner in which the slope of this curve changes. Okay. Uh, can anyone quickly tell me what that corresponds to? <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, that's where the glass transition is supposed to happen. And, and there's some change in the behavior of whatever I might compute as a Gibbs free energy as I go below. <coughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, maybe I will not persist on that. And now if I go further down, there is some point below which sorry, this branch does not continue. Okay. Uh, actually, it's a little bit misleading because uh, I can obviously have the glass state continue beyond that. But what is uh, shown in this the solid red line is the liquid free energy branch. Okay, so the idea is there's some lowest temperature below which the, this, the solid red line cannot continue. Okay, so if at all it continues, it will continue as a glass branch. Okay, so that's sort of the, the thermodynamic picture one has, right? But Clearly, all of this can happen only if the system does not crystallize, and then it's game over, right? Uh, so one, one must pay some attention to uh, when, under what conditions, crystallization can be prevented, and, and uh, when it cannot be, right? Uh, and the ease with which crystallization is uh, uh, sidestepped is called glass forming up. And I'll say a little bit more about it. Oh, but before that, uh, to address something that Vishnu was asking, so cooling a liquid down is sort of one standard way by which you form a glass, but it's not the only way, right? So there are many, many different ways that are shown here. I won't go through all of them except uh, vapor deposition, which is an interesting way that has recently been used by Mark Ediger. Uh, to create very, very stable glasses. Okay? But the idea is very simple. You have a cold substrate, and you drop atoms one by one. I mean, that's not so simple. But you can, you can you, you deposit vapor onto this cold substrate, 
which is cold enough that when the atoms come, they stick. Okay? And since they're coming in, in some in a disordered way, uh, they stick in a disordered way. And depending on what the temperature is, their ability to reorganize is limited, and they don't typically form a regular structure, but they form a glass. Uh, like that, there are many other different possible ways, and in fact, <coughs> something you might call an amorphous solid and not a glass is something where I cannot simply cool it down, but have to use one of these other approaches, and that's the only way I can make this amorphous solid. Okay, so um, here, um, <coughs> when I have a supercooled liquid, uh, I have fluctuations that correspond to crystalline order, right? Uh, this is, it, at a finite temperature, there will be fluctuations, and some of those fluctuations will correspond to a local order of the system due to more crystalline structures. Then the question is, when will that local fluctuation grow and engulf the whole system, and when does it not? Okay? And the nucleation picture is basically that if I form a certain sized crystalline fluctuation, let's call it a crystallite, okay? uh, then it has two contributions to its work of formation. Right? One is that inside that region, the free energy is decreased because the crystal has the lower free energy. Right? But there's also the fact that there is a surface tension between the crystalline phase and the liquid phase. You know, since these two do not mesh well with each other, there's a surface tension cost. Okay? And for small enough crystallites, the surface tension will win. Okay? Um, <clears throat> because uh, the, the scaling of the surface, you know, it depends on the values, of course, but uh, this goes as if n is the number of atoms inside one of these nuclei, uh, the surface tension penalty goes as n to the thirds. <laughs> Whereas the surface tension gain goes as n, right? Where n is, uh, sorry, where delta G is the difference in the free energy between the liquid state and, and, the, and the crystalline state, right? So it's a negative number, right? And uh, so if I forget this term, if I look at large enough n, this delta, I, some... The labels are uh, not exactly consistent. Don't worry about it. What is being shown here is what I'm calling delta G prime. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so this delta G prime at large enough n uh, will, will keep going down, down, down. Because the more of the system <clears throat> that's in the crystalline state, the lower the free energy. Okay? But for small uh, sizes or radii that's shown in this picture, there is this additional term which is positive, so the surface tension is a positive number, so this will go up, okay? So um, <coughs> there is a critical size uh, at which this will no longer work against me, and, and I begin to go down, okay? So this is called the critical nucleus. Okay? If I manage to form <coughs> Uh, a structure that's bigger than the critical nucleus, then I will spontaneously crystallize. Okay. Then the question to ask is, how probable is it that I form a critical nucleus? Okay. So based on this picture, uh, what will be your answer? I am way behind time already, okay? So you people should answer simple questions. I don't feel like going forward, if you're not answering these questions, because that, that means that I'm going to lose you very soon. Huh? But if I wait for a long time, then I lose time. So I can't get to the, the rest of the talk. So, any, huh? Right, yeah? So this is now an activated process where the system has to cross a free energy barrier, and that free energy barrier is this, OK? 
say the maximum value uh, of, of this delta G. And uh, if I evaluate what that is, uh, based on maximizing this expression here, I find an expression that it's inversely proportional to the free energy difference with per mole between the crystal and the liquid. And, and it ha it's, you know, it, it's proportional to the cube of the surface tension. Okay, these are details. Just like, as I get close to the melting temperature from below, this barrier diverges. Does that make sense? Because delta G is going to zero and the barrier is diverging. Does that make sense to you? Right? But on the other hand, if I go very, very low in temperature, this delta G, presumably based on this picture here, um, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, this uh, free energy barrier should become arbitrarily small. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question then is, uh, how can I form a how can I form a glass because the free energy barrier to crystallization is just going away, right? As I go to low enough temperatures, so that's the question to ask. And the way you answer it is to say, <laughs> you know, if if you know the the important quantity for me to, to to know and understand is the rate at which these critical nuclei form. Okay, and it depends not just on the free energy barrier but also on a pre-factor, which is important. So here um, <coughs> is, is a pre-factor, which is called the mobility. So I'll put D because that's usually uh, taken to be the diffusion coefficient. Um, and in the simplest case, the diffusion coefficient decreases as an exponential of the uh, <coughs> inverse temperature. And this form is called what? Arrhenius temperature dependence, right? So I assume that the diffusion coefficient is all, the, the diffusion process is also an activated process. There is some activation energy. And so as I go to low temperatures, the diffusion uh, um, is getting smaller and smaller. Also note that, sorry, even though this delta G is going down, uh, the thermal energy, which, which, which will make me cross the barrier, is also going down, right? So there's also an implicit competition there. And uh, I can sort of write a simple-minded expression by assuming that uh, my delta H, the enthalpy difference between the liquid and the solid remains constant and the entropy difference between my liquid and solid remains constant, in which case the free energy, the Gibbs free energy difference can be written as the simple linear form, okay? Um, <coughs> so I'm just assuming this, whatever, if I have the crystal phase and I have the liquid phase, I'm just assuming that this difference is growing linear, okay? So let's not uh, talk more about that. Um, then you can sort of write in terms of a reduced temperature T over Tm, that's all this is. Uh, I can write the nucleation rate as this expression here. This E prime over theta comes from the diffusion coefficient having an activated form. <coughs> and, and this term is a rewriting of this expression here. And uh, just hold on. And what you should note is that this is a non-monotonic uh, expression, which means that the nucleation rate, which will start out by increasing, or the nucleation time that starts out by decreasing, will eventually go back up. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure. Yes, but let's not talk about that. I'm way behind time. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're talking about three-dimensional systems. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that gets complicated because there is an additional phase to worry about, etc. But uh, let's just say 
there is a, a liquid phase and a, and a crystal phase. Uh, okay, so um, now basically what this means is that if I take the liquid in equilibrium and I cool it down sufficiently fast, I can, I can go into a regime where I can then comfortably study the formation of glasses. Okay? And, and this is called a critical cooling rate. And uh, so here is sort of a picture of uh, how to understand it. Now, this is um, a representation as a function of temperature on the x-axis of the relaxation of the relevant time scales. Okay? So this time scale here, t, which is called tau2, <coughs> is, is a time scale that's associated with molecular motion. Okay? And this time scale, which is called tau1, is this non-monotonic time scale to the formation of crystalline critical nuclei. Okay? And what is shown here is that this curve lies above this curve. Right? And, and, and so if you go down in temperature at a pace that sort of beats this nose of the tau 1 curve, then you can go into the supercool state, where, which, is glass, which is the glass forming zone. Okay? And that is represented here, where what, these are experimental curves, which show the amount of time taken as a function of temperature uh, to transform a given fraction of the system to the crystal phase. Okay? And these are non-monotonic. And the idea is, uh, and, and, you know, there's a little bit of fuzziness here because there is supposed to be implicitly some tolerable degree of crystallinity. Okay? Uh, but let's go with that. Huh? And, uh, and uh, I, I spent too much time on this. Um, but and so the idea is that if I were to decrease the temperature fast enough that I miss this nose, right, for whatever is the acceptable degree of crystallinity, then I, I, <coughs> I form a glass. Okay? So there is a cooling rate that, that is a minimum cooling rate that is needed in order to form glasses. And this is not at all a serious issue for many molecular glasses that people study, uh, such as orthoterfinal, which is uh, <clears throat> a complicated enough molecule. It doesn't form crystals very easily, um, but it's a very serious issue for stuff like this, uh, which is a cartoon representation of a metallic glass. And uh, so metals, again, won't go into details, but uh, atomic systems are easy to crystallize and the way experimentalists try to sort of get around this is to, to sort of form uh, multi-component mixtures. And there is sort of a lot of uh, empiricism that goes into what is a, the best way to choose the composition such that the crystallization rates are, are tolerable. So let me leave this topic there. Okay, now. That's a whole different talk. I'm not giving now, okay? Uh, because uh, I, I think there are other things to get to, uh, but you can talk to me later. Yeah? Um, okay. So now, <clears throat> um, so we've so far avoided crystallization. Okay. Uh, so the first line in the typical paper on glass, <laughs> the glass transition, we've got through. Okay. Now, uh, here is what happens if you do avoid crystallization and go to lower and lower temperatures without worrying about crystals, right? Uh, so what is shown here is the viscosity on a log scale as a function of the inverse temperature. And this is again called an Arrhenius plot um, because if you have Arrhenius behavior, you will have a straight line on, in this representation of the viscosity, okay? Now, <clears throat> in the spirit of assuming nothing, uh, very quickly, uh, viscosity is a measure of how easily liquids flow when, when they're subjected to external stress. So this is the, the relation that typically defines the viscosity, where sigma is, is the shear stress that you apply on the system, and, and uh, this is the uh, gamma is the shear, and therefore gamma dot is the shear rate, that is the rate at which it will, will slide uh, along, and, and the proportionality constant is the viscosity. Okay? Uh, there are definitions, and I'll mention it later on. So now, viscosities of glass formers increase rapidly, where rapidly means 
faster than Arrhenius, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so this rapid increase <clears throat> is well described for many glass formers, but not uniquely and not non-controversially by what is called the fogel fulcher thumman relation, which, which I have written down here, where instead of an exponential of some constant over t, I have the exponential of some constant divided by t minus t zero. Okay? And uh, what's a qualitatively different consequence of writing this form rather than the simple Arrhenius form? Right? So viscosity will diverge at this finite uh, temperature, T naught. Okay? This is, like I said, a fit function. And, and uh, okay, uh, we'll not worry about whether it's true, et cetera, right now. Okay? Because what happens in, in practice is that when the viscosity reaches some large value of 10 to the 13 poise, uh, liquids stop flowing on experimental time scales. Okay? And, uh, so relaxation times, and you know, again, I'll, I'll say a little bit about how you go from this to this later on. Um, <coughs> um, so if you look, so just let's imagine that relaxation time simply means the time taken for the material to come to equilibrium, starting from some arbitrary state, and and that relaxation time goes beyond 100 seconds, right? So order of our attention span. So, uh, and if you go further to lower temperatures, you, you don't have equilibrium uh, fast enough. Okay, and that's the glass transition. Okay, so this is clearly now an arbitrary definition. It's, it's sort of a function of us, right? Because that's our uh, patience. Um, <clears throat> but, um, <clears throat> but if you imagine that if you, that you cool down a liquid at some rate, uh, then, and if you keep going, right, then effectively uh, there is a change of properties at this temperature at which you cross a characteristic time scale or a, or a characteristic value of the viscosity, uh, which is dependent on your cooling rate, right? And then you go uh, too quickly to lower temperatures so the properties of your system don't change anymore. That's roughly uh, what happens. But before we get to that, you can ask, you know, when you say, when you see data like this, uh, what we are used to uh, in, 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 in uh, physics and in, in uh, a lot of uh, quantitative sciences is to ask, is there a way of normalizing uh, uh, quantities uh, such that I have some universal behavior, right? Or normalizing the scaling, yeah. Sorry? Well, non-zero, where zero is within some tolerance, right? That's, that's a quick answer, because you are looking only down to a certain low frequency limit. Yeah. But so down to that limit, yes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so then the question is, can can I sort of simplify this picture somehow by by scaling all the viscosities to the glass transition value? Right? And this is done in this plot, and the quick answer is so here the scaling temperature is the glass transition, the experimental glass transition temperature, and what you find is in fact that there's a whole zoo of, of behavior. At one extreme, uh, you have basically Arrhenius behavior, right? And at the other extreme, you have something that's very strongly curved and uh, uh, apparently closer to a divergence than the, the systems at the other end, okay? Uh, so these uh, different types of behaviors are quantified by something called the fragility, which is, you know, again, I won't go into the details of, of uh, uh, so I can take this relation and I can sort of rewrite it in such a way that I have a coefficient k, which if it is bigger, I get behavior like this. 
and if it is smaller, I get the end. Okay, so that's called a fragility index. Um, and and uh, many of the papers that again are written about glass formers uh, refer to fragile liquids, and basically all that means is that they have liquids that show a temperature dependence which is strongly non-Arrhenius uh, rather than Arrhenius behavior because if you simply have Arrhenius temperature dependence of some dynamical or inner property, there's not much to explain. Okay? You may run out of uh, patients at some point, so you can't do experiments with lower and lower temperatures, but there's nothing apparently special about this is what happens whenever the phenomenon you're looking at has an activation step. Okay? Uh, whereas if you have a strong non arrhenius temperature dependence, that seems to warrant an explanation. Okay. <clears throat> so um, this is a different representation of what I already said. Let's say I'm looking at some property like volume or the enthalpy. Uh, I have the equilibrium liquid here, and I'm cooling it down. And at some point, I don't, I'm not in equilibrium anymore, and I go off on a different branch. Okay? So the slope with which the volume or the enthalpy is changing will change. Okay? So uh, one way of saying that quantitatively is to say that the coefficient of thermal expansion jumps to a lower value, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, the same liquid, if I were to cool it slower, will exhibit this transition at, at a, a lower temperature, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, simply, the glass transition is, uh, the glass transition temperature decreases if the cooling rate decreases. So the glass transition temperature is a function of the cooling rate. <coughs> and uh, um, this is, again, the same plot of the volume versus temperature. Uh, so uh, because there is a dependence of where the glass transition happens uh, on the cooling rate, if I were to sort of cool down at one rate and heat up at a different rate, I can find interesting hysteretic not talk more about this. Now, one of the things that happens in addition to uh, a jump in the coefficient of thermal expansion, so everyone knows what that means, right? It's the rate at which a substance expands or contracts when you change temperature. Okay? So glasses <coughs> expand or contract a lot less than liquids. Okay? Um, so here is now uh, uh, another property, the heat capacity, and this is again shown as a function of temperature. There is branch. Normally, when you have crystallization, you jump down to the crystal branch. So the crystal has a lower heat capacity than the liquid. Um, but if you were to continue on in the supercooled liquid, at the glass transition, there is also a jump down in the heat capacity. Okay? So again, the liquid has lower heat capacity than, uh, sorry, the glass has lower heat capacity than the liquid. Okay? And uh, now, again, where this happens depends on the cooling rate. And uh, for different systems, this jump in the heat capacity is very variable and seems loosely to be correlated with the fragility of the glass forms. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now, the fact that the liquid heat capacity is lower, uh, is higher than that of the glass or the crystal, uh, means that if I were to now look at the excess heat capacity of the liquid, right, this is some positive value, right, which means that if I were to um, <laughs> look at how the excess entropy of the liquid over the crystal changes as I go to low temperatures. That excess entropy is going to do what? 
Huh? Now, what is the relation between entropy and the heat capacity? Cp equals. Huh? Speak up, whoever said whatever. Somebody said something, no? T. Okay, so the heat capacity is temperature times the derivative of the entropy, right? Um, so therefore, I can write the entropy at some given temperature with reference to some reference temperature as the integral from that temperature to the desired temperature of Cp divided by T. Okay, and since Cp or delta Cp of the liquid over the crystal is, is a positive value, that means that if I'm decreasing the temperature, the excess entropy of the liquid, which is some given value at the melting temperature, will decrease. Right? So that's what's shown here. Here is the excess entropy of the liquid over the crystal, normalized to its value at the melting temperature, <coughs> plotted against the normalized temperature to the melting temperature. Okay, so you're starting from 1, 1 here, and the excess entropy is decreasing. Now, uh, in some cases, it's decreasing so fast that uh, if I keep going, it seems to vanish at a finite temperature. Okay? And so if I have the excess entropy of the liquid respect to the crystal vanish at a finite temperature, what does it mean about the two entropies? Is the liquid entropy equal to the crystal entropy at that temperature? That's what it means, right? That the difference is zero. And uh, so this is, you okay with that? If the liquid entropy were to be the same as the crystal entropy, why not? No, no, they both have many configurations. Huh? Hmm. No, so... Actually, if I talk about the crystal, huh, these are all sort of classical temperatures, no modes of frozen, right? And likewise for the liquid, right? The liquid will have finite diffusion coefficient, etc. right? So, um, well, not quite, but close. Uh, so that, you know, that's not exactly the logic. Um, so why, why are you surprised, or why, why are you unhappy with the, liquid entropy being the same as the crystal entropy. Hmm? Okay, so this, this un discomfort is based on the idea that crystals are somehow more ordered and therefore, I mean, that's true. Crystals are more ordered, right? There are quantifiable, that's a quantifiable statement. But therefore, you think that the entropy should be lesser, right? And that actually is a fallacy. And uh, Don Frankel talked about it at some length, so I, I won't repeat. But for normal circumstances, that's probably, uh, that's probably uh, what you should expect. The crystal should be. So there's something very funny happening here. But then, um, I, I, if I ask, um, what, what if I and, and under any conditions, uh, if I say that the liquid has a higher entropy than the crystal, where is that additional entropy coming from? Okay. Uh, so, first of all, where is the entropy of a crystal coming from? vibrations about the minimum, right? Now, do I have a corresponding component of the 
entropy for a liquid. So Manoj says yes. Who else says yes? So liquids also, I mean, it, we don't know exactly how to think about vibrations around something. But there is some sort of vibration-like motion that liquids will also have. Okay? So uh, let's suppose for the sake of argument that for the liquid and the crystal, at a given temperature, these entropies are roughly the same. Right? Then where is the rest of the entropy of the liquid coming from? Don't, I mean, you know the answer, right? But uh, I'm asking this question so that you can say it in words that you would if you were thinking about it for the first time. But say it. So I'm saying, let's imagine that if I were to think of vibrations around a reference configuration in the liquid, that entropy is roughly the same as vibrations around a crystalline reference configuration. Right? Then where else is that additional entropy of the liquid coming from? Hmm? So, in the language that I'm expressing this in, uh, the answer is it's coming from the fact that there are many possible reference configurations I could think of. Right? Um, so, um, <coughs> so, just to summarize, um, <coughs> first of all, this excess entropy vanishing happens only if I extrapolate. The, the measurable data. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. And uh, by extrapolation, this entropy, the excess entropy of the liquid or the crystal appears to vanish at a finite temperature. Okay. Um, and this is considered to be paradoxical uh, based on certain preconceived notions about uh, order and entropy, which we should have gotten wiser about in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but nevertheless, in a normal situation, it's probably uh, okay to be puzzled, right? Um, so then the question is, so, you know, if, if the reason for my thinking that this is paradoxical is, 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 is valid, uh, what happens? What happens when I cross this uh, temperature uh, at which this excess entropy vanishes? Okay? And the... Resolution in practice is, in fact, you never quite get there because you always have the glass transition happening before you reach that point. Okay? Uh, so this is a, uh, you, so you dodge the problem, right? Because you always have the glass transition. So, but then you should ask, you know, that's a pretty funny coincidence, right? That there is this problem of the excess entropy vanishing Whenever I'm headed towards that problem situation, the glass transition comes to the rescue. So is that a coincidence? Are they connected? That's one question. Then um, I can say, you know, but if I had the patience and, and the life uh, of astronomical proportions, then I can cool down slower and slower, and I've already sort of been told the glass transition temperature will go to lower and lower values as I cool slower, then eventually what happens? Okay. So then I must be able to reach in equilibrium, where I mean by equilibrium anything but the crystal, so let's not uh, go back to that issue. Um, then I must be able to reach this point in equilibrium. Then does something happen? The idea is that this vanishing of this excess entropy signals the, a phase transition, a thermodynamic phase transition. Okay. Um, and whether that's true or not is what many of the people working in this uh, field sort of spend a lot of time worrying. What's the meaning of the excess entropy? 
we have said a little bit already, uh, it corresponds to uh, the multiplicity of distinct structures that the liquid can be. Um, so all of these things we will come back to. Um, now, I, it's okay if I go over a little bit, because I, I want to get through sort of this segment. Uh, so there's a little bit, so I'm going to go a little bit fast to something I shouldn't. Huh? But uh, we'll, we'll yeah, try to ask me questions. Uh, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, this is again a repeat of what happens now. If I've done a fast quench of the liquid and I'm sitting here and then I wait, what happens? Right? So uh, what is found is that if this point is close enough to the glass transition temperature, there is a slow relaxation towards the equilibrium state. Okay? And this is called recovery. Uh, so you're, re you're recovering the equilibrium liquid. Um, and behavior like this, uh, you can see when you look at the, the delta of the volume as a function of temperature. Oh, sorry, as a function of time for different temperatures. So the, this delta V is the volume at which you are stuck here minus the volume you're supposed to be at. Okay? That should eventually go to zero if you were to reach equilibrium. And what you find is that you do see a relaxation towards delta V going to zero, right? Uh, but this time scale here, uh, the H stands for hours. So this happens over a time scale of hundreds of hours, which is not normally the time scale over which you make an experimental measurement in, in physics. So these are very, very slow processes, but there is a process which is very slow that takes you to the equilibrium, right? Um, so, and this process is called aging. And uh, <clears throat> something that's very interesting, so this was against the different curves was, were for different temperatures, okay? But then let's ask, I, I sit at this temperature, don't change the temperature now. And I let the system recover to different degrees. And then I make a measurement, which tells me some property of the system. Does that property change? Okay. And how does that property change? Okay. So one uh, typical measurement uh, that people do is uh, creep. Yeah. So creep is basically, if I apply a stress, a sheer stress to the material, it slowly moves in that direction. Okay, that's called creep. Okay, so <laughs> apply a force, I'm holding the bottom fixed, okay, and then it'll sort of move. So this is, is uh, my strain, right? The change of, of the lateral position with go up is uh, defines for me a strain and the strain uh, slowly increases okay now uh, without too much elaboration if I just look at that strain normalized by 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 the stress that I apply let's imagine that I apply uh, a stress in a step fashion and then I sit and wait <coughs> What I find is that the strain will sort of go like this and reach some equilibrium value. Okay? And uh, so the creep compliance is basically that quantity. So this is x, uh, x axis is time, y axis is this creep compliance. And so it, it slowly goes up. The time is on a logarithmic scale. That's so the curve looks funny. Let's not worry about it. But the important thing <coughs> for you to note is that. If I sit for some amount of time and then I make this measurement, I get a curve like this. If I sit for longer and make this measurement, then I get a curve like this. If I sit even longer, and so you get the idea. So the longer I recover the system, the longer is the time required for me to reach the same compliance, and I make a creep compliance measurement. 
Is that clear? Yeah. So if I attach, let's say for this value, 3.5, the time taken to reach a compliance of 3.5, I call my relaxation time, right? And the time that I've sat at this temperature, I call the waiting time, right? Then what is found is that this relaxation time goes as the waiting time to some power. So the longer I wait, the longer it takes me to reach the same compile. Is this something you okay with? Okay. Anyway, it's it's rather interesting behavior that requires some explanation. Okay, which I'm not going to offer, but I'm going to tell you one more thing about how aging behavior manifests in, in, in something dramatic, and then I'll stop. Um, but actually, I have to go through it. Should I stop here, and then come to the next slide? Uh, yeah. OK, so yeah, this is, uh, let me then stop before that. Uh, because that, that may be, but uh, you know, but then I speak after lunch, so is that a better time? <laughs> I'll stop. Okay, uh, yeah, so let me stop here, where, which, uh, um, yeah, so this is now, uh, sorry, let me say a couple of qualitative things and then I'll stop. So one way of thinking about it, is that as I wait longer and longer, I'm effectively going to a lower and lower temperature. So there's some effective temperature in my system that's getting lower the longer I wait. Okay, that's one way of thinking about it. And uh, so then you have to say, OK, how do you define effective temperatures? Now, for, for aging systems, I'm not going to tell Well, I'll tell you later on after I talk about the classification distribution theorem. But right now, uh, let me just sort of say, what something like an effective temperature might mean. Uh, so in, in, in sort of people who make real glasses, define something called the fictive temperature, which is basically a temperature that's associated with the structure of the glass, which in turn is associated with where the system fell out of the okay. and And so you make a construction, so by looking at the heat capacity as a function of temperature, you sort of you know, which is sort of a messy curve, but you define <clears throat> through some matching of areas where you say the liquid-like behavior continues and then sharply decreases to the glass-like behavior. And that sharp point you identify, like I said, by, by matching areas. I won't go into the details. But basically, by doing all of this, you define <laughs> a, what's called a fictive temperature for a glass is the temperature at which it got frozen in. Therefore, everything else that happens uh, will depend on this temperature. For an aging system, this fictive temperature will also change. Um, but the important point is that whatever I call the fictive temperature, so, so if I've gone through the glass transition, I'm sitting here, my thermometer temperature is 400 Kelvin. right? But my fictive temperature will be whatever it was determined to be, which is 560. So there, there's a decoupling of, of my thermal thermometer temperature and, and the temperature associated with the structure that's frozen. Um, OK, this is just to say that this aging behavior is also seen in other systems. And then the, this I'll come back to the last sort of phenomenology that I wanted to tell you, which you already heard, and I won't say too much, that if I go further down to lower temperatures, approaching zero, then you have anomalous behavior for glasses, uh, such as the heat capacity anomaly. So the heat capacity goes linearly with temperature as opposed to uh, temperature cube. And uh, so um, that's sort of a survey of uh, behavior uh, of, of the phenomenology of, of glass formation, 
And so I'm, I'm going to sort of take this as a starting point to start talking about dynamics, except because of the context of aging, I'm sort of going to do it backwards by starting with the most complicated dynamics. And then, and then I'll talk about central dynamics. Okay? All right. Yeah. Um, you talked about the glass transition as something that saved uh, the system from the excess entropy disappearing, right? So in a typical first order, uh, if, if let's say uh, the glass transition didn't happen, then wouldn't the uh, homogeneous nucleation temperature also save it from that thing anyway? Um, right. um, in fact, that, that's sort of the, the way out that Kausman originally proposed homogeneous nucleation would always intervene, right? But, uh, but in, and, and that seems to be the case for some glass formers. Um, but uh, because of the reasons that I outlined in the first part, which is that the, the mobility changes in the glass, in, in the glass former will also make a contribution to the nucleation rates, uh, a more typical situation uh, is that you can actually uh, circumvent homogeneous nucleation and go to the glass. Uh, I mean, you know, there are obviously systems where homogeneous nucleation will kill you, and that we don't see. <laughs> They're not glass formers. And then there are systems which, where you can get around it, and that's the, those are the systems we call glass formers. Yeah, there was a whole point of talking about glass forming ability in the beginning. There are situations that you know you do have to get around homogeneous nuclear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The temperature versus you had drawn the temperature versus density curve, mm. and uh, after a density rho a. You had drawn a slightly increasing line. So what does that part represent? The glass transition line. I was, I was drawing the glass transition temperature as a function of density. Right. So rho A is the threshold density to form a stable glass. That's what you had. A homogeneous glass. Homogeneous glass. Okay. 